Welcome everyone to the Antinatalist Advocacy Podcast, where we speak to interesting and knowledgeable people about how best to protect sentient beings from the harms of coming into existence. I am your host, John, an antinatalist advocate from the UK, and I'll be the main host of the podcast going forward. What does the word nature mean to you? For me, the word nature used to conjure up images of happy animals living in harmony in beautiful environments free from human interference, but no longer. I now believe that this optimistic view of the lives of wild animals is far from the truth. Wild animal suffering is a big, big problem. This is the third episode in our podcast series, diving deep into our four cause areas at AA. Having explored human procreation and animal agriculture, we wanted to bring on someone who could explain what wild animal suffering is and why they believe it's such an important issue. And we couldn't think of anyone better to talk about this topic than Humane Hancock. Humane Hancock is an experienced animal rights activist. He gained a following on his YouTube channel with his vegan outreach videos with members of the public. But more recently, however, he's focused quite a bit on the harm experienced by wild animals in nature, which tends to be a bit of a moral blind spot for people concerned with suffering. It was great to have Humane Hancock on to explore the topic of wild animal suffering and why it should be of concern for us as antinatalists. Anyway, without further ado, I bring you episode 9 of the Antinatalist Advocacy Podcast with Humane Hancock. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to episode nine of the Antinatalist Advocacy Podcast. Welcome to you, Jack Humane Hancock. It's great to have you with us. Hi, thanks for having me on. Great. Um, bit of a stuck record at the beginning of these podcasts, but always begin with, um, yeah, just tell us a bit about yourself, where you're from, what you're interested in, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just a random sentient being, really. <laughs> <laughs> One of many on this planet. <laughs> yeah, and I'm originally from North Wales, Wrexham. Uh, I now live in London and for the last maybe like six or seven years or so, I've been splitting my time between making YouTube videos about animal ethics, both farmed animal suffering and wild animal suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also making a documentary. So one thing that like some people are interested to learn about me, given the kind of career path I'm on is that my father has been a slaughterhouse worker for over mm -hmm. 30 years. Um, so. Yeah, I wanted to make a documentary. There's like, I really think there's a, a huge gap in this space. I think when you look at a lot of the, the documentaries that are out there, I think they've been really effective in, in growing the movement. But I also think that they've often been very difficult to watch for mm. people who aren't already convinced or aren't willing to to watch graphic footage. So I wanted to, to make a documentary that is um, using narrative to like come up with a really nice story that is engaging and entertaining to watch, but also uh, promotes messaging for, uh, moral, spreading moral concern for farmed animals. Um, so that's taking a lot of my time yeah. lately. Um, yeah. And I'm kind of switching between spending a lot of time on a documentary and then yeah, trying to find some time to, to work on some videos. Um, but that's, that's what I'm doing with my life. Great. And when roughly will the documentary be ready or is it mm. like a, uh, how long, not how long speed stream, you know, one of those questions, which is very difficult to. I give a precise answer to. Yeah, I mean, I was hoping it would be ready by now. Um, mm -hmm. I was just working with an editor and we kind of had a rough cut ready. And then I was like, ah, I don't think it's as good as it can be. So now I'm looking for another editor with more experience with features. So basically mm -hmm. the, the vast majority of the film has been shot. Right. Um, it's just about molding it together in a really nice, engaging way in a way that can kind of compete with the documentaries that have more money <laughs> and yes. bigger teams. Um, and I really want to get it right. It feels like the, this is like the story that I only have one chance of telling because it's so yeah. personal with me and my dad. Uh, and it feels like when I release it in my life, in terms of like the, the 
arc of like moral progress it doesn't seem that important when it comes out you know it's more important that you get it right yes um, absolutely so i'm really um trying to take my time with it and and make sure i get the right people on board and yeah it's like a real journey it's really i could ramble about this for like the next two hours but it's really like a, a huge learning experience because i didn't know anything about documentary filmmaking when i started i've been mm -hmm. learning as i go and i think that's one of the reasons why it's it's taken so long um but i'm also glad that it's taken this long because if you know i originally planned that it that it would take like a year and when i think back to myself like five years ago i'm like that guy was a freaking idiot like, i'm so <laughs> glad there i'm so because i've like kind of changed my mind on multiple things like regarding yeah. to, like animal ethics and strategy strategic considerations so um, i think it's uh, a blessing in disguise that i've been so slow to, to move this project along but i do feel like pressure because i release i like told everyone i'm making this film and then i'm like <laughs> away for like five years but um, it is, it is, there is work going on behind the scenes. It is progressing. <laughs> Great. To, to be fair, I did hear through the grapevine that you were working on a documentary and I'm now trying to figure out how long ago that was. It was probably <laughs> over a year ago now, but yeah. I'm aware that these things can take, um, a really long time. And as you said, to do it as like, for one of a better word, like an independent filmmaker without that big team behind you, that's uh, mm. quite an undertaking. So that's really impressive. Thanks. <laughs> and you mentioned, um, obviously, your dad was slaughterhouse worker growing up in quite a rural part of the UK. I imagine North Wales, not not too many vegans around there in North Wales, I'd say. Oh, I didn't know any vegans <laughs> at the time. Uh, so it's like really funny because I became, I like went straight to like being the, the most like preachy, like loud <laughs> vegan. So like my friends have got like all these videos of us being drunk on a night out and we just like not shutting up. <laughs> like my, my friend gets his like Snapchat out and he's recording me and I'm like, animals are being tortured every day for taste pleasure. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you're still in Wales when you went vegan? Oh, well, I, I went vegan in university and I did my degree in Bangor in mm. Wales. Oh, um, nice. And yeah, and I, I was like visiting home like at Christmas and uh, summer and whatnot so um yeah hi so i say this as someone who also grew up in quite a rural place in norfolk and didn't know any vegan i knew one who was like a kind of cool hippie person so it kind of makes mm -hmm. sense um we yeah, also went vegan at uni and then my friends were like oh you've changed you've changed and now i live in london so i'm part of the tofu eating woke karate soy voice <laughs> and then, you know my friends from north are like oh you've changed you londoners so. <laughs> but it's interesting um yeah like how people kind of come across like the subject so how did you as most people will know you from your animal advocacy work we've been talking about the youtube channel etc so how did you become an animal advocate in the first place yeah I, I feel like um you know in like movies and stories there's often this like one inciting incident that kind of changes everything yeah um and so i think for most of us like no reality seems to be like a bit more complicated than that and it's like yes. lots of kind of seeds are planted and it kind of builds up and then you change your mind um and so like it almost feels hard for me to like, I, I, I worry that I'm like rationalizing when I look back now, I think it's yeah. like hard to even be like fully aware of like what our motivations are <laughs> for doing things. And like, um, but I'm going to like throw a few things out there, I guess that like played a role. I think, I, I think that it, it would be reasonable to say that I I'm probably like predisposed to being like an animal advocate or like a vegan because I was always very empathetic towards animals as a child. Um, to insects, for instance, like I wouldn't let my dad, crush insects around the house i'd be like making them take making him take them outside and then like going with him because i knew he'd like hold them like aggressively and perhaps like squash them when he was doing it so i'd be like trying to make sure he doesn't hurt them on the way out um and my mum has these like stories of me like showing concern for animals when i was mm -hmm. very young that i don't really remember so for instance we'd be like walking past a butcher's shop and there would be these pigs the carcasses hanging down and apparently I would be like, yes, mum, they're fixing the piggies. Oh, and my mum's yeah. like, uh, I'm not gonna tell him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I remember, and this is like probably like the most impressive thing I can say about my childhood. Like, I'm, this kind of helps with my self-esteem remembering this. Yeah. That like, I was very young and I said to my mum, you know, if, if like an, an intelligent alien species came down and enslaved us and ate us, we'd all call them evil, right? And she's like, yeah, I guess we would. And I'm like, but isn't that what we're doing to like farmed animals? And she's like, 
Yeah, I guess we are. And <laughs> so how was, old were you at the time? Oh, I'm really bad at remembering, like, uh, like associating specific ages with memories. I have no idea. Like, the margin of error here is going to make me sound like there's something wrong with me. It's like, it, <laughs> I could I could have been six. <laughs> I could have been 13. I don't know. <laughs> um, and this, I mean, we're going to talk about wild animal suffering a bit later, but I, I have similar like memories attached to like concern for wild animals as well. Yeah. Um, so a- anyway, I'm rambling, but I feel like there is this, um, yeah, it almost feels like I was kind of predisposed to like care about this issue. Like it's maybe a genetic thing. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would like as a teenager, I would argue with my Muslim friend about halal meat, mm. uh, like halal meat when the animals aren't stunned before slaughter. And he would be like, yeah, but you eat meat. I mean, you're killing them. Uh, and I would kind of take psychological refuge in the idea of humane slaughter. Yes. I would say, yeah, but if an animal has an amazing life and then they get shot in the back of the head and they don't think any, any, don't know about it at all, then like, yeah, I'm okay with that. But I had no idea what was actually happening. Yes. You know, it's just like this, I just told myself that and took refuge in that idea as if that was, that, that was actually the case when obviously it really, really, really isn't like that. Yeah. Um, and that is exactly what I did, taking refuge. I like that phrase of like, you're not really exploring whether or not the idea is true, mm-hmm. but the idea is comforting and therefore yes. you cling on to it. And I did exactly the same thing with the same idea. I was like, well, you know, yeah. animals live good lives. And if it wasn't for me, they wouldn't get to live. It's obviously relevant for the topic of antinatalism. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's interesting how like, yeah, we put up these kind of mental barriers. Like we put them up ourselves to... Mm-hmm exploring kind of dangerous kind of thoughts yeah um, there's a there's a lot of motivated reasoning going on i think yes. with our our beliefs um, definitely and i think we we're all guilty it. of it and i'm probably guilty of it right now because i i didn't think i was guilty of it before mm-hmm. but now i recognize it um yeah i'm probably there's a there's yeah. probably a few beliefs which i am um yeah definitely we're just taking we're just... refuge in <laughs> We're just apes with these like evolved brains that are like not suited to be like doing what we're doing right now. And of course, yeah. like, we're going to be like, uh, there's going to be all kinds of like cognitive biases going on Definitely. all the time. And, Definitely. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I had to so my first girlfriend in university was a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. And I think that, she, you know, she wasn't like a, a vocal ethical vegetarian. She kind of had been vegetarian since she was seven and I think it was just really a habit from that point on but i think her existence as a vegetarian was like making it more clear to me that this is like a choice i'm making i guess yes. i was just like very passive in my life um and it, it became more clear that this is like a con like this, this can be a conscious choice i don't need to be doing this um eating animals and and i'm not sure what happened first i I think there was two things. I basically went down the vegan rabbit hole. I mean, I, I started watching YouTube videos of Earthling Ed, um, some of the old OGs, Banana Warrior Princess. Yeah, shout out yeah. to you. I was like binge Norfolk watching. as well, for where I grew up. Yeah. Kind of banana, banana Warrior Princess, even if I can't say that now. <laughs> yeah, I started like binge watching uh, street interview content. Uh, for some reason, I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, but before I was vegan as well. And then I read Animal Liberation by Peter Singer um and yeah kind of gradually realized that that, that i can't um justify not being vegan it became Mm. like very obvious that i had to be vegan (laughs) um and and then as soon as i became vegan it was also very obvious that i felt like i had to be an activist because you know what i cared about was the the suffering that's happening to farmed animals Mm. and um, that problem still exists, even if my hands are clean, it might exist to a lesser extent, but like the thing I care about is, is still happening. So, yeah, definitely. And I think, um, it's just picking up on something you're saying earlier about how it's like a gradual process of when you made the decision, it is less of a kind of sexy appealing story than the born again moment. Like in the Bible, the road to Damascus when the truth appears in front of you. Like, I definitely didn't have that. And I I think that, you know, there was a very definite moment where I made a decision to go vegan. I remember that. But there was, as you said, lots of seeds being planted and lots that led up to that. Mm -hmm. And I do think, therefore, like anyone who's advocating for a cause needs to bear in mind that they probably, even if it's a cause that they have subsequently adopted, they probably didn't change on the spot. 
and therefore we shouldn't be expecting other people to. It's not like the first time that you and I heard a good argument for going vegan that we instantly went vegan on the spot, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And it's easy to forget that when you become yes. like so impassioned, like rightfully so, like so impassioned with yeah. like what's happening and, and expecting everyone to be able to look at this thing that's obviously terrible. Yes, it's so, ob- it's so obvious to me. It's like, well, it wasn't <laughs> obvious to you before you were vegan. But and it is obvious, people, right? Like it should <laughs> be obvious. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, it's important to like, um, yeah, keep some empathy for, for, the, for the fact that people, like there's a lot of behavior changes really complicated. This is yeah, why people like, could struggle to, to lose weight and change their consumption behaviors. And it's, um, there's a lot of psychological baggage when it comes to, I think, acknowledging the, the suffering of farmed animals, um, because, you know, you're kind of complicit in it. Yeah. Uh, and so it's like, I think, uh, a very good sign that someone's open-minded enough to, to be able to acknowledge that and change their behavior. Definitely. What I'm saying is that we are special. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, and I do worry, and I see this a bit in the antenatalist community as well, that people do kind of talk a bit like, you know, we are the ones with the truth. And you need to remember that lots of people feel that way. Um, with lots of people we disagree with feel that way. Um, yeah. But yeah, speaking of, as we talked before about like ideas and, and putting up barriers to uncomfortable ideas, um, we, we will get to wild animal suffering in a moment. But in terms of uncomfortable ideas, how did you first become interested in or at least aware of antinatalism? Once I became vegan, I moved to London and was embedded in this vegan community of activists. And that was a really fun time because we like first started exploring um, ethical ideas and philosophical mm. ideas like free will and, and antinatalism came up. If I had to guess, I would say it probably came up from George Martin, mm. uh, the guy who runs Carnism Debunked. Yes. Because um, he was really into it. Um, so I ended up reading better never to have been, which I thought was super interesting, really compelling read. Uh, I must say like, I'm not uh, particularly knowledgeable about like antinatalism philosophy. I'm Mm -hmm. much more focused and comfortable uh, in the realm of animal ethics. (laughs) Yes. Um, But yeah, I read the book and I I thought it was really interesting and I don't plan to ever have kids. I definitely, I, I feel much the same way. I don't feel that like I'm some sort of guru when it comes to antinatalist philosophy, for sure. Um, I kind of approach the topic of having children as like a kind of like a probability, you know, on balance, is this something that I should do? Mm. And there are multiple reasons um, as to why I think it probably is a bad idea to bring sentient beings into existence. Um, but it does interact interestingly with the main topic of today's podcast, which is wild animal suffering in ways that we'll get to shortly. But first of all, did you first want to give like a very quick introduction as to the topic of wild animal suffering? Like what is it and why do you think it's important? Yeah. um, Wild animal suffering refers to the negative experiences of animals who are not domesticated. Mm -hmm. So this can include animals in areas that we would typically see as wilderness, but it can also include animals who live among us, like pigeons, for instance. Yeah. Uh, And I think we tend to romanticize and idealize nature and the lives of wild animals, but actually they've got it really tough. They have to deal with things like starvation, like disease, like parasitism, like harsh weather conditions and accidents, the the list goes on. Um, And I think there are many reasons why we might be prone to turning a blind eye to wild animal suffering and and failing to really acknowledge and see its seriousness. Mm. Um, But, you know, in reality, there are individuals out there who feel pain, uh, anxiety uh, and suffer just like pigs, chickens, cows, cats and dogs do. Uh, And I really do think that this is a major moral blind spot. You know, the vast majority of sentient minds on this planet are wild animals. Yes. So if we want the world to be a good place to live, I think this issue has to be recognized. Definitely. And you mentioned about it being a big moral blind spot, because although you did mention the story earlier about having concern for wild animals, uh, I imagine this wasn't a topic that you became, that you've always been aware of. Even, as you said, in vegan circles, this appears to be a bit of a blind spot. So how did you first become aware of the you know, the topic of wild animal suffering and its moral importance? Yeah, I, I do have a, a childhood memory here. Um, 
Yeah, so, I mean, it's a bit of a blurry memory, but when I was very young, I was watching nature documentaries and so became aware of the fact that animals are being eaten alive. And that really affected me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I really, I remember my mum saying, it's just something you've got to get over, Jack. Here we are 20 years later. <laughs> Still not over it. <laughs> Still not over it. Um, but I think that's kind of interesting that like something that adults will kind of just see as normal to the point where we don't even really like properly empathize with the beings involved in the situation because it's just kind of like normal and natural. It's just the way things are. You've mm. got to just get over it. But then like as a very young person who's just kind of like learning about the world, you just see something and you're like, wait, that is completely terrible. <laughs> yes. um, and of course I should say that like, I think a lot of people, because like predation is kind of like the, the thing that people first think of when they consider wild animal suffering. But uh, I should point out that like, there are lots of other forms of suffering in nature, like the ones I discussed earlier. I think maybe yes. people who, uh, first hear about the topic and be like oh but you just want to like stop predation that's crazy but like you know even if let's say there was nothing that could be done about predation uh that wouldn't even mean that there's nothing we could do to alleviate a lot of wild animal suffering um so anyway i am digressing but the the point is i did seem to have a concern for wild animal suffering at a young age and i think as i was vegan i kind of already had this belief before I really thought about it, like at an intellectual level, I was like, yeah, like what's happening to wild animals kind of sucks. Mm -hmm. um, and then I met, uh, I had a friend called Debbie who was part of the effective altruism movement. And we were just sitting down chatting one day, we met through vegan activism and she just started telling me that like, yeah, wild, like that there's like a movement to do something about wild animal suffering. Um, and yeah, started talking more in depth about things like scale and, uh, and, and then that kind of set me off. So then, uh, I mean, up until that point, I, w I had my YouTube channel, but I was focusing purely on farmed animals and veganism. Mm. And from that point I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to like start making videos about this. Cause, um, yeah, I think this is a really important issue. And then I started reading more about it. I started reading articles by Brian Tomasic on reducing suffering.org. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that, that's, I guess that's how I became involved. Right. And you've already mentioned some of the kind of mental barriers that we have, uh, to acknowledging the problem of wild animal suffering, such as, um, you know, it's just natural. It's a part of life, etc. There's nothing that we can do about it. You have to kind of get over it. Mm. What would you say are the common arguments that you hear against, um, well, one being concerned about wild animal suffering and secondly, like taking action to alleviate it. Mm. I think that, um, yeah, I think that maybe w perhaps the most common is the idea that, um, it's like impossible to, mm. to have a positive impact that this is just like too crazy an idea that humans are too dumb and we'll probably just make things worse if we, if we ever try and do anything to help. Yeah. And we will get on to kind of like impact in a moment, but I do think certainly in my experience talking about wild animal suffering, that idea that the problem is just intractable, that mm. like there is nothing that we can do about it. Mm. That does seem to kind of paralyze people to some extent. Um, but what about the more, I love like moral arguments against intervening in kind of a, um, mm. if not a deontological sense, but you know, a firm rule against intervening, even if we had the capability to, Yeah, for absolutely. example, that, you know, you Jack, you just want to play God. You want to stop, <laughs> stop the lions eating the deer and you're just trying to play God. What about those kind of arguments? Yeah. I mean, you, you won't be surprised to hear that. I don't think they, they hold up, but <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you hear that you hear, I've had, when I first started talking about the topic on my YouTube channel, people, a few people did comment saying I had a God complex. <laughs> um, and you're you like, I do, but not, <laughs> yeah, I do, but that's not relevant to this. <laughs> um, uh, you also hear the argument that, uh, we shouldn't take agency 
away from the animals yes uh, as well and there's there's a bunch of others we, we can talk about as well definitely and i think the god one is really interesting because people just would not use that in a human context you know after the huge tsunami on boxing day i think it's like 20 years ago now which is a natural event no free will involved you know an act of god so to speak mm. there weren't people saying that we should just you know leave people to die afterwards because to intervene would be playing god um, yeah but it's a very common one that you hear when it comes Absol to wild animal suffering absolutely and i think that you know there is some do i want to say wisdom but there's something there to acknowledge i, I do think that like it's important not to overestimate our ability to yes. predict the consequences of our actions when Absolutely, it comes yes. to the systems that are very complex and that we have like very little knowledge about right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, just look around us. I mean, we've played God and altered nature in so many ways to improve yes. human well-being. Um, you know, we build schools and hospitals <laughs> and homeless shelters. Um, we seem to have no issue playing God if it's in order to, to benefit our species. Yes. Um, and that seems speciesist to me. I mean, I can't see any reason why we would say that I like my suffering matters and I deserve help. I should be allowed pain relief and medical treatment when I suffer, but, but helping wild animals. Oh no, that's, that's playing God. I mean, how incredibly convenient to view like th that those in nature should be left to suffer, but like, we're going to play God every possible chance we get in order to improve our lives and make our yes. lives as easy as possible. Um, you know, like it's playing God to, to try and help animals who are starving to death. But like, we get annoyed if we have to wait like a few months for our free healthcare or like yes. wait in line 20 minutes for a vegan hot dog. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And I, I do think that playing God kind of, um, that, yeah, that, that playing God kind of argument is applied quite inconsistently. Mm. I do, however, think that although it's a similar argument, I do think that this one has more kind of moral intuitive appeal. And that is the idea that the wild animal suffering that you're talking about, Jack, that is not our fault. It's, we didn't cause this. And therefore, at the arguments even phrased, either we don't have to do anything about it or we should focus on other stuff first. And I do admit that this does have an intuitive kind of moral appeal that we mm. think that we have to, and this often comes from vegans, you know, they're like, we should stop the harm that we're doing to animals, such mm. as you know, animal agriculture, before we try and prevent the harm that we're not directly responsible for. And it does have a moral appeal. So what do you think about this particular argument, the idea that we're not responsible for wild animal suffering? Yeah, um, so I I don't think, I mean, I agree that it, it is intuitive to say that like, we're not the cause of the problem uh, and therefore like, it's not our responsibility to, yes. to, to do anything about it. Um, but I don't think that in of itself, like whether we cause the suffering is actually morally relevant. Yes. Now, I think there might be some practical reasons why we want to focus on alleviating the suffering we cause, because in many cases, it's probably going to be easier to like stop harming than it is to alleviate suffering we're not causing. Yes. Um, but like, okay, so let's, if I imagine two scenarios, let's imagine that there's a deer and a human being throws a rock and it hits that deer's leg and they have a broken leg. Yes. Um, I think that we would like say that that deer suffering matters. Okay. We should do something about it. If you imagine another scenario where the deer, where the rock just falls off the top of a hill, hits the deer in the leg. Um, and they have a broken leg, same amount of suffering. It seems to me that like, we should still help. I mean, the, the experience of the deer hasn't changed. Um, the deer has no comprehension really as to whether the, the cause of their suffering and pain is from a human or not. It's only something that we care about. It's, it's very like a very anthropocentric view. Mm -hmm. If we take the perspective of the one who is in need, of the animal, the animal's perspective, it becomes clear that what they care about is the suffering and pain and not being in that. Yes. Um, and likewise to me as well, like when I'm, when I'm suffering, if it's from uh, a natural problem, uh, it's, it's not really, um, I, I don't think that that means that I'm, I should be, uh, less likely to be helped. Mm. I don't think that the, the children who are suffering with malaria can be made to feel better by being told that it's like a natural disease and humans aren't, aren't the cause of it. 
Yes. Um, I, I think that ultimately what matters is like the, the experience of sentient beings on this planet. Um, and yeah, with that in mind, I think that like in and of itself, whether or not humans cause the problem, it isn't what really matters. And I think vegans should be able to, to see this because like we are not no longer causing like the suffering of farmed animals. Right. But we yeah. still like care about their suffering and, and want that to change. Definitely. And I do think, as you were saying, like it, it ultimately doesn't matter to the person who is experiencing the suffering. Mm -hmm. I think that maybe for some people, as you were saying, that maybe for some people it would be less, you'd feel less angry if your cause of suffering was like a natural one compared to a, um, an agent you, know, you get caused by at. someone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Someone kind of punched me in the face or like, I don't know, some natural, like some wind blew a rock and it hit me. In the, and, I, and I got the same amount of damage, like a black eye. I'd be more annoyed mm. about the person hitting me. Yeah. And you've evolved, I mean, that makes sense, right? You've like evolved to, to feel that way, I think. Yes, like, exactly. Yeah. It's um, like when, when a moral agent causes the harm, it is more, that, that, it triggers your injustice. Definitely. Kind of definitely. Feeling more I, than um, like a natural cause. But yeah, I, that, think so. that, I, I think, I think this, sorry to interrupt. I think no this worries. is like a, I mean, I think this is like a, a problem for like the wild animal suffering movement, um, because I think that largely like movements are like, well, not, maybe not largely, but in part, I think movements are grown by like an anger <laughs> towards yes. an injustice, like an anger towards a perpetrator. Uh, but, but I kind of see it as a perpetrator bias because I don't think that it's ultimately what matters. I think what matters is the experience. Yes, absolutely. And that's, I didn't think of it like that, but that is a really important point. And a really key roadblock is it's even though I think that wild animal suffering is a huge problem, I don't have that feeling of like righteous anger. Mm. Other kind of like social issues or social justice issues make me feel. And he said that is a huge kind of roadblock there. Um, what do you maybe, think to the argument? Oh, sorry. Were you gonna say? I was going to say maybe we can like convince you that God exists and you can see him as the perpetrator and then you'll. Exactly. The problem of evil from God. <laughs> like, there's no free will involved. You made the world this way. Um, <laughs> although, to be fair, if you do know your Bible, you'll know that in Genesis, um, uh, the, the lion ate straw like the ox, I think is the exact phrase. But the mm. idea is that all the, all the animals were, were living a good time. And then actually when humans, you know, they stole the apple. Uh, yeah. and, and create a fallen world that was when animals started eating each other so according to the bible we are responsible for yeah well and then that could be the angry moment that <laughs> well, we convince a lot of christians that humans yeah. are responsible for this for stealing the apple in the yeah. uh, in the garden of eden i guess another way to get there would be to like be convinced of the simulation argument right and you're like oh that's the reality before us that created us in the simulation they're the ones that have caused all the suffering that's true that's true someone's created the matrix and they've decided <laughs> cruel cruel people have decided to make lions eat deer and all, all the other kind of wild animal suffering that we see um it is something that we touched on earlier but i guess as you said i think it comes into the perpetrator bias as well but i think and without getting too philosophical there is certainly an intuitive case that people have a moral obligation to stop the harm they are doing compared to doing good, if this makes sense. It's like negative um, actions, or not negative actions, but like your negative obligations. Do not steal, do not torture, do not kill, etc. Uh, they have more moral weight than positive actions. So it's more important that you don't murder someone than if you then it's important for you to save their life. Mm. And I still, I, I can't logically see why that is the case, but it does have some sort of moral appeal to me. Like, for example, just in the realm of humans, like Bill Gates, through his foundation and through all the money he's donated, has probably saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. Yet if I found out that Bill Gates had murdered two people, I wouldn't <laughs> sit there and be like, well, he killed two. He saved hundreds of thousands. <laughs> like everyone would think that Bill Gates was a huge scumbag, even though yeah. if you look at his actions in total, he saved many more lives than he would have taken away. Oh, that, that is interesting, isn't it? I have exactly the same intuition as you. That, yes. like, causing harm feels worse than not preventing harm. Yes. Um, and if that is the case, then that would mean that other social issues, which are talking about comparatively small harm, so like I don't know, I, I don't mean to diminish it, but say like internet bullying, which is not mm. it's obviously a pretty terrible thing, but 
I'd say the internet bullying probably cool is is responsible for less suffering and death than what happens in the wild. I think that most people mm. would admit <laughs> that. Um, but if this moral intuition holds, it would say that we would have to stop all forms of harm caused by humans, whether that's internet bullying or I don't know, telling mean jokes, whatever it would be like. We'd have a moral obligation to stop that before we got round to the tremendous amount of suffering in nature that we weren't causing. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think it does hold. I mean, like for the reasons I described earlier. Yeah. I don't know. Like we, does it say something different about someone's intention? Like, is, is it about intention? Maybe? I don't know. Um, but for whatever reason, like it does seem to be widespread this intuition that like causing is much, hurt. I mean, like, I think this is, you see it in the vegan community, right? Like, yes. Vegans are generally speaking, ethical vegans at least, are like kind of like boycotting animal products so they don't cause harm. And I think many vegans would be like, all right, job done. Yes. <laughs> you know, like uh, I'm no longer causing harm. So that's, but like um, uh, vegans, are, they might not see it as an obligation to give to charity, you know, to, to donate to effective charities that are trying to, to do something about animal suffering. Um, and so, yeah, I think maybe this this is this is something that I've changed my mind on over time. I think mm. I think when I first became vegan, I did have this view that like the obligation is not to cause harm, but we don't we don't need to help people. You know, yes. like our base our baseline is just like what it would have been like if you weren't here. Yeah. Um, uh, and then yeah, the, the more I kind of contemplated that, the more I I decided that for me, like no, it's just like suffering is that matter is what matters. Yes. Um, not the cause it, it's me who cares about the cause it's not it's not the animal yeah and um, one thing to add to that point especially you're saying about giving to charity which is something that we really promote at antinatalist advocacy even if you don't believe that we do have a moral obligation to do good so beyond the not causing harm but the actual mm. obligation to do good such, such as giving to charity um it would be a very strange ethical position i believe to say that giving to charity or doing positive good is not a better option than the alternative of just you know doing nothing mm -hmm. you know if i have a thousand pounds and i could donate it to an effective charity or i can burn it you know just light the money on fire um most people would agree that at least one of them is a better thing to do even if they don't think that i would have a moral obligation to right. to do good in that opportunity and um, you know you know like when when you so did you previously have the view that it was like okay the obligation is not to cause harm um i don't necessarily need to, to help others yes that was my yeah. and then i came across peter singer's famous article. right of course um, yeah yeah i, I think I, that like the, oh. the world it's a nice place to be in that mindset i think because <laughs> like when you're not in that mindset you can't end up having to contemplate things like wait well yeah if i'm obligated to help others like i'm choosing between like going out tonight and having and spending like 25 pound on, on cocktails when i could buy you know, like five malaria nets and pre yes. potentially prevent a die from a, a child from dying. Yes. Uh, so you kind of realize that you're acting immorally, <laughs> like <laughs> in many, many ways. And you're like kind of, yeah, being, being like selfish and um, it seems kind of unjustifiable. Yes. And it is a comforting place to be in that place. I think, well, at least I'm not doing any harm. And yeah. um, as you say, because you can go down the rabbit hole of where do my positive obligations end? And we are certainly planning on doing an episode about how to approach charitable giving and our obligations to do good. Mm. And my general approach is that rather than trying to shame people or e even shame myself into saying that you should never, um, like every effort that you make should try and do good. I think um, there's something there about, you know, taking the opportunities that you can. And even if you don't think we have those obligations, just saying it's probably a better thing to do. And trying to build positive feelings around it because this the headspace that you're in that you've, you've spoken about is one that i've been in and it's quite a negative one it's a feeling mm -hmm. of like oh no I, I you know i bought a takeaway and it was 10 pounds and i could have donated it and eaten some rice and peas i had in my cupboard instead mm -hmm. if i wanted that tasty food um like trying to frame it like a positive kind of habit to or like positive feelings around doing good you don't mm. feel that nagging guilt to the same extent. You, you, know, you don't want to get the takeaway because you, know, you feel good about giving to charity. Right. Um, wary that this is a bit of a tangent, but it is something that we do talk about a lot of advocacy, so we'll be talking about that in the future for sure. Mm. Um, so if you don't think that the 
because obviously we've covered some of the arguments against um, being concerned about wild animal suffering, and obviously we've gone through our reasons for thinking why they don't, um, why they don't particularly hold up. So if we are convinced that wild animal suffering is a problem, and at the very least, a lot of people would think that if the, even if they thought that we couldn't do anything about it, they'd probably say this isn't something that we should try to make worse. Mm. What do you think uh, wild animal suffering means for, um, yeah, for, for like antinatalism and population ethics and whether or not it's a good idea to have children? Because I think there are a lot of people out there who don't want to have children for ethical reasons, who haven't yet considered, um, you know, what wild animal suffering means for their kind of like moral choices. Yeah. Um, so I think when I kind of first went down the, the vegan rabbit hole, I think it happens to many vegans where you can become kind of like pessimistic about human existence because you see yes. how much immense suffering the humans are causing for often such like trivial benefits yes um when i consider the suffering of wild animals i and consider like the meaninglessness of it all you know like the fact that this is all happening because of like gene replication <laughs> uh like trillions and trillions of individual sentient beings like dying painfully since the beginning of sentience on planet earth. Mm. And then somehow this like meaningless unguided process gives rise to a species who not only has the power to, to shape the earth, how we want it, but also has the potential to actually care about the beings who live here. Yes. You know, not, not just the beings, not just themselves and the beings that look like them, but beings who like look so incredibly different to them. Um, and of course, we don't know how much the idea to help wild animals is going to grow. But I do think that if you're an antinatalist, you have to, you know, an antinatalist who, who thinks human extinction is good, you do have to battle with the fact that the vast majority of beings on this planet sentient beings are wild animals yeah uh, and that means that 99.9 percent .9 of life will continue to suffer under the current system if we don't do something if we don't stick around to do something about it um so i think kind of like i'm probably rambling but to bring it back to your question i think that you could be perhaps i don't know if this term makes sense but like an anthropocentric um antinatalist i guess so if you if you kind of only care about human beings then of course, like species extinction is great. But I think if you include non-human animals in your moral circle of consideration, uh, then depending on, on what you think the likelihood is of, of human beings helping or trying to help, uh, then yeah, human extinction begins to to look like a potential bad thing, which I think will be like very counterintuitive to like many yes. antinatalists listening. Um, but yeah, the other point is obviously that like, I mean, I don't know, maybe some people agree with me, disagree with me on this, but I think in reality, like humans going extinct because of antinatalist ideas seems like very, very, very unlikely. And it seems yes. much more likely that antinatalist ideas would, would result in less humans being born. Um, but then there's all kinds of interesting questions you, you can delve into there where it's like, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think that antinatalism or concern for wild animals will like necessarily it's not like we're going to have like one gene. It's like the antinatalist gene. But I do think that there are going to be um, genetic differences related to, to our moral thinking, like increased empathy, for example. Um, yes. That, you know, if, if, if the people who are more likely to be empathetic um, or predisposed to being very high in empathy are not having children, then maybe like future generations will like have less empathy and, Yes. Therefore, like the world's gonna be a worse place. So antinatalists, like get to your nearest sperm bank <laughs> and spread your values for the future of wild animals. <laughs> Definitely. I have to say, you said that was a bit rambly, but I think I agree with pretty much every word. I think it's just one of the toughest things to um that is it's almost like two thoughts that don't obviously go together, mm. but I think really do. And that is the thought that 
if you believe that it's a bad idea to create sentient being well not to create sentient beings for sentient beings to be brought into existence then you really do want to keep humans around because we're the only ones who can actually do anything as you said about most of the sentient beings being brought into existence and all the suffering that they endure like if you think that human lives are full of suffering and my goodness human lives are on the whole a hell of a lot better than the lives of most wild animals as you're saying starving to death freezing, dying of disease, um, being literally ripped apart, eaten alive. Mm. Um, most humans, fortunately, don't need to go through these things, which are just so endemic in the um, so endemic in the in the natural world. And as you said, Jack, we are the only species that can actually do anything about it. So I definitely agree that human extinction, at least as it relates to wild animals, well, there are some big concerns about that. Now, there are, there is the argument that humans, as we have done with factory farming, we can actually create things which are even worse than the state of nature. And that while we do have a capacity to do good, we may also, you know, create the matrix, which is just, you know, like factory farming times a million. Mm. And it probably would have been better off for us not to have stayed around to not like create all this additional suffering. Absolutely. But, I do think this is something that antinatalists need to take seriously is the fact that, um, well, first of all, as you said, it's extremely unlikely that there will be, uh, that antinatalist ideas will cause human extinction, but even having it as an end goal, as something to pin your flag to, I don't think is a very good idea because that end goal would have, yeah, would leave a tremendous number of sentient beings who live much worse lives than humans. Just, yeah breeding and breeding and yeah suffering yeah. like like you said I, 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 like you said i think you could you know you, you could acknowledge you could have the view where you acknowledge that but you think that humans are just much more likely to cause astronomical amounts more suffering through like yes digital sentience or spreading ecosystems of wild animals through additional planets yes um so i think you can have like a, a very reasonable view of like yeah that's true but like humans should still go extinct anyway because, like, <laughs> our track record really sucks um that's true yeah but um you know just to touch on something else you're saying about this like comparison between human life and wild animal life i mean i guess many antinatalists are antinatalists out of a concern for the quality of, of human existence yes uh, and you were you were describing some of the things that wild animals have to face that humans don't typically have to face I think um, another thing worth mentioning is like the, the reproductive strategies um, of animals in the wild compared to us. I mean, human beings have a reproductive strategy where we tend to have a very small number of offspring and invest yes. lots of resources into them. Uh, but the vast majority of wild animals have reproductive strategies where they have lots of offspring and don't have any parental investment. Um, and when you look at the population dynamics uh, in nature, if a population remains stable, only two offspring per parent will survive to adulthood and reproduce themselves. So yeah. you get to this sad conclusion that it, it seems like the vast majority of wild animals are dying in infancy. Yeah. Uh, and when you consider the ways that animals die, whether it's being eaten or whether it's starvation, it seems typically bad. <laughs> and yes. they haven't obviously been around very long to experience pleasure. Uh, so... Yeah, it seems that if if you are an antinatalist out of concern for human existence, then you should also, you know, be concerned with with wild animal existence and their quality of lives when they seem to have it worse than we do. Definitely. And as we've said, and one more thing that you actually touched on is that maybe some traits related to empathy are genetic, mm. um, and there may be. Uh, you know, antinatalists, if we do have, it sounds very self righteous to say this, if we do have more empathy than the average person, then uh, we should be wary about these things. Um, you know, we should we should be wary about these traits not being around for the future mm. generations. What does that mean then for me and you, for example, two people who are concerned about wild animal suffering and are yet are choosing not to have children? <laughs> What do you think that all of these concerns packaged together means for our moral obligations for having children as individuals? Wow. Yeah. Big question. Um, I'm like very uncertain. 
like like you know the the consequences of our actions are like the further down you go the kind of like knock-on effects it just becomes impossible to really like calculate with any certainty whether something's good yes. or bad and it can lead to like all these counterintuitive things but yes like when it comes to having a child, it's like <laughs> consequences of that. Like I can't even fathom, you know? Um, and so I, I I don't want to have children for like personal reasons. Like I just don't want that for myself. That's, I think, what is the main reason. Like I said before, I think it's like, I, I, I think that we, we all kind of like lack more self-awareness than we would like to acknowledge. And yes. Like, <laughs> kind of deceive ourselves and things. And so... You know, when people have asked me this before, I have said, like, you know, part of it is like a concern for, for suffering. Um, but I think that even if I didn't have that concern for suffering, I probably would not be leaning towards having children myself. Um, but like, yeah, the the kind of... I do think it's going to be true that antinatalists will be higher in a, on average in empathy than, than yes. people. And I think that's also going to be true for, for vegans as well. Yes. And I think there's been there's been some research conducted fairly recently suggesting that like vegetarianism has a, a genetic component. Um, and so, yeah, I am like, I, like I actually do know somebody who, and this is going to sound crazy. But I know. So, I mean, maybe I've told you this before in private. Is someone who some, donates sperm. Is this the guy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, someone who actually does donate sperm for like value spreading <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at least that's what he tells me <laughs> um i mean that's that's like an extreme outlier but like i guess i am like i'm i'm not judgmental when i hear about someone having children because i'm like very very uncertain about like the effects the overall effects of that you know it's not yes. just it's there's like the experience of the the human being um, but then there's all of these knock-on effects. Like, how does more humans affect the population sizes of wild animals yes. in ecosystems? Um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't really know what what else to to say about this other than that. Like, I do think it sounds reasonable to say that like higher empathy people not having children could potentially be bad for for like the future of humanity. Yes, definitely. And I think that is something that we do need to take seriously. Like, I. I also, because of the concern for wild animal suffering, I don't have the, uh, you know, I don't feel angry at people for having children. I think in a vacuum, I, I think it's a bad idea to create sentient beings. Mm. But as you said, in the world that we live in, some people who have children, it's hard to know whether or not that, that will amount to more or less suffering, and particularly as it relates to wild animal suffering, mm. like over the long run. I do think, however, though, that... If you do want to do good in the world, and something that we said on previous podcasts, if you do want to do good in the world, I think there are other things available to you other than having your own children. So a huge motivator for me not to have children is to donate the money that I would otherwise spend on having children to charitable causes, kind of spread my values that way mm. rather than through my genes. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a really, a really good point. And I yeah, I find it highly unlikely that like having children would be the like optimal way to like yes. do altruism in the world. Definitely, um, and it's like something that I've thought about as well. Like, I want to dedicate my my life to trying to reduce animal suffering, and um, that's hard enough to do when like I haven't got sentient beings to look after. Yes, <laughs> it's hard <laughs> enough when I've just got to look after this sentient being. Like, <laughs> that's like it's all it's already like a, a big task. Um, and so, I think I will be like much more effective if I can really just focus my life on on this issue. Um, yeah, definitely, and I think that is something that we would say to people is that just because you are um an antinatalist just because you have come to the conclusion that it's a bad idea to for sentient beings to come into existence it doesn't commit you to one path and certainly not one form of activism i find that mm. quite often people think that oh i'm an antinatalist therefore what i need to do is go out and tell people not to have children mm. and i don't think that, that follows at all like it, it can mean many different things but it doesn't mean that you have to go around telling people judging people for having children um, it can, you can, there are other ways that you can prevent suffering from occurring that are seem to be a lot more effective than than doing just that, such as going vegan or yeah. uh, donating money to donating money to charity. Um, although, although perhaps someone could argue that, like, yeah, getting people to to stop having children is like better than arguably better than vegan activism because if if someone's never born, then they're not going to be buying animal products. Um, 
you know, there were, there were, I guess there were like other considerations with like changing culture when you like, when you get someone to go vegan and change your attitudes towards yes. animals, it's like more changing this kind of culture that could have a better long-term effect. But I do think there's something to be said for like less people coming to existence is going to mean like less factory farming. Yes, this is true. And I do think this is something that we have to factor in. And there's something that's really hard to measure is like the meme of veganism or like the spreading of ideas, mm. um, which obviously does happen if you, if you, you know, try to actively spread the ideas of veganism rather than just having fewer advocating fewer people and mm. um, it's it's tough morality is tough guys this mm. is something that we've said on this podcast <laughs> podcast before it is difficult to do the right thing and especially when wild animal suffering gets involved like i was definitely as you were saying uh going down the and like the misanthropic kind of path of why humans here were doing such awful things and then i found out about wild animal suffering and say oh humans need to stay here but i think it's a bad idea to create them so it's it's a tough thing um but what we will say and something that we have talked about before is that yeah if you do want to do good in the world there are things other than having children that uh, uh you can do and you can also you know you don't need to be in conflict with your ethics you know you don't need to have kids and tell them I think it's a bad idea to bring sentience into the world, but just so you know, I really want you to go out and trash the environment, you know, just like, <laughs> just like burn grass and never let it regrow and <laughs> um, build car parks wherever you go. So you'll bring the number of wild animals down. Um, there are other things you can do to be impactful. Although I do think, and maybe this is a subject for another day. I do think that so long as if you're an anti-natalist, you know, so long as it doesn't increase the overall amount of human births which might go against antinatalist ethics donating to a sperm bank to pass on your your good wholesome antinatalist genes it might not be such a bad thing to do i don't know <laughs> yeah i mean like i can see an ethical if, argument for it <laughs> yeah if like you know there's a couple who are going to have children anyway it is so funny like <laughs> where philosophy could take you like you're like this <laughs> anti-natalist podcast and you're like genuinely like you're genuinely saying like yeah but i do think that you know if you're not gonna have your own kids but like you, you could go to a sperm bank and start exactly of your you, you know it wouldn't it wouldn't conflict with most people's versions of anti-natalism if they weren't yeah. causing the number of people born to right. exist you know yeah. they might just get the sperm of some guy who's not a compassionate person so yeah i think that you know if you think you've got good genes overall um you, if you're an antinatalist, you've probably got like higher empathy and compassion than the <laughs> person. So like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've said before that, you know, I went bald and I was 22 and I'm useless at all sports. So I don't think that people are going to want to inherit my genes if they, if they saw that on the, in the form. Um, so there's probably other reasons why people might not want my sperm at a sperm bank. You know, if you're, if you're a good looking guy and you're a nice dude, you should go, you can consider it. Um, sorry, away from sperm and back to wild animal suffering. Um, we've talked about obviously how, you know, the, the difficulties in this area of knowing what the good thing to do is or ways that we can have an impact. But as we said before, the, probably the most common objection that I've seen on like an anecdotal basis is this kind of throw your hands up in the air. What can we actually do about wild animal suffering? So if someone comes to you, Jack, and they say, look, you've convinced me, wild animal suffering, big problem, something that in an ideal world wouldn't happen, but in the world that we live in right now, what can we do about it? What would you say? Yeah, I think it's like an understandable perspective to have to be like, look, I'm convinced that wild animal suffering matters, uh, but like, what are humans going to do? Um to like, I guess, to kind of like steel man the arguments, one might say like, you know, ecosystems are so complicated and interconnected that like surely anything cause that we do could potentially make things worse and we wouldn't even know if it was making things worse. Mm. Um, and I think that's- a good And there point. are examples, sorry, I just gonna say, there are examples of where humans have tried to, you know, improve in air quotes ecosystems and have had very counterintuitive and unintended consequences. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, people often will use that as like, uh like they'll say look look at what humans have done in the past like we'll yes. never be able to make things better but but of course like we in the past we've never been trying to make things better we've been intervening for anthropocentric reasons to, yes. to for like environmental reasons for us um we haven't even been measuring the welfare effects um and i think that's that's actually a really important point to bring up is that like we are kind of intervening all of the time whether we like it or not 
Yes. Whether it's from the pesticides we use or whether it's from anthropogenic climate change, we are constantly changing the numbers of wild animals, the different species that are coming into existence and their experiences. Um, so I think what we need to start doing is actually considering the effect on the well-being of animals. And I think if there's, if you imagine like two worlds, one world where we continue intervening as we are, but only for anthropocentric reasons without even acknowledging the problem of wild animal suffering, I think we're more likely to cause more harm and make things worse there than in a world where we actually acknowledge this as an important issue and actually like take it into account when it comes to like policy, for instance. Mm. Um, I, I sometimes use the analogy of like the human body where I think, you know, in the 18th century, people could have said that, that look, the human body is, is so complicated and interconnected. You know, before the advent of modern medicine, maybe people would have said, like, there's no point interfering, like, in the human body. We're going to make things worse. It's just far too complicated. It's mm. playing God to suggest that we can uh, improve human health. But instead, humanity conducted research. And over many years of research, they discovered ways that we can reliably make things better. And similarly, there is a, a new field of study called welfare biology, where researchers are attempting to learn about the lives of wild animals so that maybe one day we can have a significant impact on their lives too. But yeah. um, it's also worth mentioning that there are people out there today helping wild animals. There are people who rescue animals from forest fires. There are people who go out and help injured or sick pigeons. And even on a, on a larger scale, uh, the, so, so we successfully eradicated rabies from fox populations in Europe uh, by dropping food that contained an oral vaccine. And, you know, rabies is a very torturous way to die. So we yes. spared thousands of animals for, from dying that way. Um, and I think uh, perhaps the most crucial point is, is that we just don't know what will or won't be possible in the future. You know, so like 200 years ago, people will have, will look, if, if the people knew how we can shape the world today, it would seem like utter magic. And I think it's likely that in 200 years, 500 years, the way that, that humans can shape the world would seem like magic to us. Um, but but we need to lay the groundwork for humans to actually want to help wild animals because, you know, it's not going to matter what technology we have and what we can potentially do if humanity never fully acknowledge the seriousness of wild animal suffering and see it as our responsibility. Even if we could, even if we could abolish wild animal suffering today, we wouldn't do it. Mm. Because there isn't enough of a desire to do it. Um, and so I really think what we what we need to be doing today is kind of laying the foundation, laying that groundwork, um, doing more research, uh, and we can help that happen. I mean, if you're a student and you're studying biology, you can, or you're interested in studying biology, you can help do that research yourself. Uh, if you have, if you're interested in making donations, you can donate to charities like Wild Animal Initiative mm -hmm. uh, and Animal Ethics, who are trying to build a research field in this area. Um, and, you know, you can do what I do a lot of the time, which is simply to raise awareness and to spread this idea of moral concern for, for wild animals. Yes. And there's something that you said there about laying the foundations, which I think is just so, so important. It's, it's interesting to be at this point in history for a mm. particular, you know, social issue or particular cause where it is so early that, as you said, people wouldn't eradicate wild animal suffering even if we had the means to because there isn't that kind of um consensus around it and there is a lot of learning to be done um mm. so as you said like there is definitely a case um there, there are definitely opportunities sorry for laying the foundations the ones that you said um you know we, we have had animal ethics and wild animal suffering on our website for a while as recommended charities for people to donate to um, to kind of, as you said, build that consensus. But there are things which are done right now. There are those positive examples, the rabies example. I believe as well that there was a parasitic worm that buried its way into the eyes of small animals and they managed to turn all of the worms female. So they stopped breeding. And, mm. you know, from an antenatalist point of view, the worms aren't suffering anymore. And more importantly, they're not burrowing into the eyes of other animals. Yeah, and we should, uh, we should say that the, these interventions seem seem good but we're doing them for anthropocentric reasons we'll be yes. we're doing them because they're affecting like farmed animals and that's affecting us yes. uh so if you if we can come up we're, we're coming up with examples here 
of humans not trying to help wild animals. Yes. But we're like, oh, look, it seems like they help wild animals. <laughs> like, what, what could be possible uh, once we get all this, get lots of research done and once we actually start thinking about wild animal welfare more seriously, you know, with that being the actual aim rather than like a, a lucky side effect. Exactly. And I did find actually that because I did initially have this, uh, you know, throw my hands up in the air, it's an intractable kind of response to wild animal suffering. Once I did actually start looking for positive examples where we have been able to do stuff already in these very early days, mm. um, it did reassure me that there were different options out there. Yeah, um, I think I oh sorry to interrupt. I was okay. going to say I, I think it's really important to kind of emphasize these examples because I yes. do think that there's this sense of hopelessness when it comes to wild animals that prevents people from being able to empathize with wild animals. It's like yes. I, I don't even want to acknowledge this problem because like we can't do anything about it anyway. So what's yes. the point? Um, so it's I almost like it's... wasted concern. Like I could mm. feel sad about what's happening, but if we can't yeah. do anything about it, is that really a good? Yeah good use of my mental state or something exactly so i think it's important when we're advocating for wild animals to to make sure we we do have some examples to, to kind of help with that sense of hopelessness definitely and one of the promising interventions which already has had some traction is and again it's interesting from an antinatalist point of view um is using contraceptives in the wild we actually had oscar halter come and talk at our conference back in december about the use of contraceptives uh, in wild animal populations. You brought up pigeons earlier. That's a key, a key population where they've used contraceptives. I know that deer, rather than shooting deer or, worst of all, reintroducing wolves to have them rip the deer apart in some deer populations, in some situations, contraceptives have been left in, you know, tasty foods that the deer will then stroll along and eat and then not, it'll bring the deer population down, which will stop like disease and, and deer starving to death and all this kind of stuff. So, Lots of positive examples from an antinatalist perspective in this field as well for those who are listening who might be interested. Maybe, um, maybe uh, the antinatalists can start putting contraceptives in human food. <laughs> ex exactly. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> Just go down, you know, like supermarket aisle, get a loaf of bread, and then I don't know, put some, put the pill, pop the pill inside one of the one of the loaves, see what happens. Never accept um, food from an antinatalist. Never, never do that. Just so you know, guys, this is obviously joking. This may or may not make it into the final cut. But, uh, I'm obviously joking here. Um, yeah, it's been a really good talk, Jack. Is there anything else you wanted to say on the subject of wild animal suffering and Ooh, or yeah. antinatalism? How they can it's it? it's been really fun. I do genuinely feel like we could just talk about wild animal suffering for like another two hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, so I could say many different things. I think I think I mentioned earlier the objection of like animal autonomy. Yes, and like if we intervene in nature, we're going to take away their autonomy or take away their freedom. So maybe it's worthwhile me just addressing that before we, we end things. I think that'll be good so, to um, yeah, you, you may not know this about me, but I suffer with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really debilitating because I, w when I stand up, the pain increases and gets worse. And so it prevents me from doing activities that I want to do and that I feel like other people my age can do. Mm. Um, and so my autonomy is being thwarted but it's not being thwarted by humans in yes. fact it's it's human intervention that may give me the opportunity to to get more freedom in my life to do what i want um and, and so i think people might have the intuition to say that uh, we shouldn't infringe upon the wild animals freedom by yes. intervening to try and help them but this assumes that this assumes that wild animals are aren't already having their autonomy infringed upon. Yes, uh, and wild animals do regularly have their autonomy taken away when they're dying slowly from a disease, yeah. when they can't find any food that they want, when they're being harmed by another animal, yeah. uh, or when they break their leg and they can't walk. So. While you, you could argue that many wild animals are free from human interference, this doesn't mean that they are free to live how they want. And I think but by creating a relationship of stewardship with wild animals, we can arguably take away some of these natural challenges so that they can actually be more free to, to live how they prefer. Yes. Um, you know, just like I would be more free to, to live how I prefer if a human intervention were to take my chronic pain away. 
Definitely. And I think this is the other side of the argument that a lot of people don't consider. And I think that's the case for the argument about autonomy. I think it's also the argument about suffering that humans can cause. So I think that it's it's hard to overplay how bad the situations that the, the living situations are for so many wild animals. That a human intervention could, yes, it could cause suffering, but the amount of suffering that is there already points towards the fact that, you know, it is already a disaster that's happening. You know, humans could cause a disaster, but a disaster is happening in the lives of animals. No human society would accept the levels of suffering and death that we see routinely in many, many wild animal populations. So I do think that when we are, and we rightly should be concerned about uh, humans making the situation worse through trying to help animals, I think we need to bear in mind that the situation is already really bad and that um, yeah, even a small improvement, given the large number of animals already in nature, even a small improvement in the lives of individuals can really go a long way. I think that's very well said. I think that it, you know, it's a moral emergency that doesn't feel like a moral emergency Definitely. because it is just like so normal and we have this like status quo yes. bias and people don't talk about it. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that as animal advocates, we are in like a constant battle throughout our entire lives to bear in mind the seriousness of these issues, whether it's farming and slaughterhouses or wild animal suffering, because there are so many reasons why we may lose track of the the seriousness and importance of, of the suffering that's happening out there um, yes. but maybe we should maybe i should say something positive <laughs> before we end <laughs> well i do have down here a positive note to end on mm. um but before we get to that is there anything that you're working on or would like to signpost people to maybe your documentary that will come out in 2035 <laughs> <laughs> um I have a playlist. So for anyone who's interested in, it's not a music playlist. I sound like I'm talking <laughs> about music, don't I? <laughs> I have this sick techno beat that I want to share with you guys. <laughs> no, I, I It's even been... more entertaining. It's, it's <laughs> a horrible state of nature for wild animals. Yeah, it's just, it's just sounds of animals screaming. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so yeah, for, for anyone who's listening who is interested in learning more about wild animal suffering, I have a playlist on my YouTube channel well, like lots of different videos cover all kinds of subjects within within the, the issue of wild animal suffering. Uh, so yeah, please go check that out. Um, you can subscribe to my channel if you're interested in in hearing more about animal ethics. Um, and yeah, I hope hopefully my my documentary will be will be finished one day. <laughs> yeah, share that with all you guys. Great. Um, well, you know, conversations about wild animal suffering and antinatalism can be quite depressing. So. As we always say at the end of every episode, it would be great to have a positive note to end on mm. uh, with, you know, these kinds of subjects. So what yeah. do you reckon? A positive I note th- to end on. I think that um, we're making progress when it comes to attitudes towards animals. Yes. Um, you know, s- some time ago, it was totally normal for royalty to burn cats alive in public squares for entertainment and Mm. crowds of human beings with the similar brains to us would be like laughing gleefully as the cats burned uh so if you don't think we're making moral progress i mean just think about how uh, people would react if king charles were to go to trafalgar square and start like burning a cat alive for entertainment yes um uh Every political party in the UK has a section in their manifesto on animal well-being. Wow. Um, I didn't know that. Until or every answer. major political party. Yeah. 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 Um, it's a to- totally normal, like a normie opinion to say that like factory farming sucks. <laughs> uh, the, we have an animal movement full of like dedicated people who are like willing to take pay cuts in order to like spend their life trying to solve this problem and, and, and do something to help animals. So I think there is reason to be positive and to, to keep going and, and to pass that, that baton of moral progress to the next generation as those did to us. Um, and I think another reason to be optimistic is that I think it's probably becoming easier and easier to make moral choices. Yes. So, you know, just like 50 years ago, it was 
probably much harder to to live a vegan lifestyle um in another 50 years perhaps we'll have cultivated meat and it it will be even easier to to live a life without harming farmed animals yes um now of course just the fact that it's easier to make moral choices doesn't mean that we necess- humanity necessarily will do so but um i do think that people needing to make less sacrifices in order to do the right thing is is a very good thing uh, and as technology continues to 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 improve i think that um yeah hope hopefully that that, that happens with it and, and the world becomes a better place to live yeah, definitely and as you said like it's easier to make ethical choices it's really easy now to go online set up a direct debit and donate to charity mm. it's easy to research a career path that you think will do good and then follow that too um we do have lots of options available to us to do good in the world. And one of the reasons that, you know, one of the, as I said before, one of the key reasons that I'm an anti-natalist and I choose to be child free um, and not try and have lots of children to trash the environment, as we talked about, <laughs> is, is the fact that it does free up your capacity to do good. And as you said, Jack, it is becoming easier and easier to do good in the world. And that's, you know, that's why we try and do this podcast and, try and do what we're doing and anti-tankless advocacy. Um, so Jack, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, the conversation's been a lot of fun, a lot more fun than the conversation about wild animal suffering and anti-natalism sounds on the tin. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah thank been, you so much really for fun. coming on. <laughs> yeah, it's been really fun. Thank you for having me. And yeah, thank you for, for doing this podcast and discussing these important ideas. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more. Great. Thanks, Jack. And keep up the good work. Um, I'll see no, but we look forward to that documentary coming out one day. Um, but yeah, thanks again. And thank you to you, the listener, for tuning in. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Antinatalist Advocacy Podcast. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. We'd also be really grateful if you could help us get the word out there by sharing this episode far and wide, as well as giving us a positive rating on whichever platform you're listening to us on. To find out more about AA, including careers advice, donation recommendations, and different ways to have a positive impact, you can go to our website at antinatalistadvocacy.org. To keep up to date with what we're up to, feel free to subscribe to our monthly newsletter and follow us on your favourite social media platforms. Links to all of the above are in the description. As always, we are hoping you will join us in our antinatalist advocacy.